Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Zoltan Diak, and thanks for joining us. We're here to talk about phishing, an age-old problem that continues to plague the security industry and organizations around the world. Phishing attacks account for more than 80% of all reported security incidents, and we've been dealing with them for decades. So why are they still so successful? We're lucky to be joined today by Jen Miller Osborne. She's the Deputy Director of our Unit 42 Threat Intelligence Team at Palo Alto Networks, one of the original creators of the MITRE attack framework, worked on the National Cyber Investigative Joint Task Force, and has probably held a few other positions I don't have a high enough clearance to know about. So hi, Jen, how are you today? Hi, I'm doing well, how are you doing? Good, you know, uh, I just wanted to start off with a little bit of a personal question. Um, I understand you're heavily involved in animal rescue. Tell us a bit about that. Sure, my husband and I are very much into animal rescue. We volunteer quite a bit with um, a local rescue here. Three of our four dogs have actually come from there. We uh, took in four six-week-old puppies because they had an emergency situation. Um, four six-week-old puppies is too many. It's like having two infant babies. There's no sleeping. There's no, but it's 100% worth it. And we absolutely love doing it. And we love our insane household full of fuzzy creatures. Um, let me ask you this. Do you have any fish? No, just the, just the fuzzies. <laughs> okay. Well, since you don't, have any pet fish, uh, let's talk a, a little bit about another kind of fish, maybe a bit nearer and dearer to your heart. Um, when we're talking about fishing, we know there are various forms. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the different types? So the most common type you'll see is just generic fishing, which is where it targets a large number of people at the same time. That's what you'll see a lot um, also around ransomware and things like that, where they're looking for the highest number of potential victims at any given time. There's also spear phishing, which is when the attackers target specific individuals, whether it's because of what they work on, a perceived level of access, maybe they're targeting executives or executive admins. So there's a level of thought that goes into that targeting. And then there's a final one called whale phishing, which is specifically targeted at a higher level executives going after them. And that's most commonly seen with business email compromise, where they're looking for the higher level executives who can potentially do that sign off for the, hey, you have to transfer $3 million for this you know, emergency deal no one knows about and you have to do it now kind right. of thing. Right. And out of those, are there some that are newer or being more commonly used these days? No, really, there isn't. Phishing and spear phishing remain um, the attacker's primary initial step of choice or initial attack of choice because they remain so successful and they're cheap and easy. And there's very little chance of the attacker themselves actually being caught or having some sort of personal um, data potentially that could identify them. So it's just a really popular way for attackers to try to get that initial foothold. So, Jen, why are these attacks still so successful? We've been dealing with them for such a long time. Um, how are attackers still able to get away with this? Because the attackers continue to capitalize on fear, essentially fear or some level of concern. So you see a lot of the social engineering still playing into this where it's a similar theme we've seen forever, right? It's Amazon, it's banking. This particular year, it was anything COVID related or mm -hmm. any sort of PPE and shots. And it's because the goal is to get people to click on these things without thinking about it too closely, to get someone to do that knee jerk reaction where, oh, this is really important. I need to open this, I need to visit this. Um, and that's a difficult behavior to train out of people, right? It's not only trying to analyze these emails, a lot of which come in, which there are similar ones, which look legitimate, um, that will be real to be able to understand what really makes a phishing email different than a traditional, a, a regular, a legitimate email. And some of the ways of figuring that out when they're really, really good can be difficult if you aren't really technical and you can't check things, say the email header metadata and you know how to parse that and what to look through. Like that's not something that's an everyday kind of thing. 
Well, and you talked about a little bit about how they're, um, you know, more sophisticated, I guess, in the way that they go about um, delivering phishing attacks. But um, are there any other changes you're seeing um, in recent years, the way attackers are using phishing? We're seeing that for a number of reasons, one of which is that phishing kits are really cheap, if not free, which helps attackers quite a bit because now they don't have to craft anything. They do very minimal effort of putting in just a couple of kind of keywords or phrases and they hit go. So there's a lot less uh, barrier to entry and it's just simple to spam potentially thousands of email addresses really quickly and really easily. We're also seeing attackers focusing more on having well done phishing sites. There's more of a recognition that people are becoming aware that they need to pay attention to what that URL looks like that they actually go to, that they need to pay attention to looking at the site to look for the hallmarks, you know, is it using SSL? Is it have the little lock? Does all the contact information on the initial page look correct? Unfortunately, they still managed to carry out um, their attacks, unfortunately, often. I've heard a little bit about um, evasive techniques that are being used in phishing attacks these days. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, for the most part, they're not super Nickel, they're trying to get around some of the automated checks that security vendors such as us build in to doing email filtering to keep it from getting to the end user. So much as we see, you know, with something, say ransomware, we see the attackers start to evolve around protections they know are in place to be successful. We're seeing attackers doing the same thing when it comes to phishing or spear phishing attacks. They're aware of some of the reasons their, their emails are getting stopped. And they're finding ways around that to ensure that, you know, if they are blocked, it's not for those particular reasons. Right. And, you know, I know people think about phishing um, with individuals as a way to steal personal information, but is that really the end goal in the enterprise or is it just the start of something larger? In some cases, we're seeing the credential theft is actually the attacker's end goal. What they wanted were credentials for a specific banking website, for a specific organization, for a specific portal or streaming service, and that's what they're intending to sell. Uh, In some cases, we'll see them potentially do enrichment or testing because then those are more valuable. So they'll guarantee these credentials work. They'll guarantee this bank account has this much money in it, things like that. But what we see for the vast majority of attackers when they do this is this is actually their first step. The easiest way to get access to a system undetected and be able to do um, nefarious login with valid credentials. And that is what attackers across the board have focused on. Rob Joyce, when he was the head of tailored access operations for NSA, actually said that that was the number one way that all of his teams carried out their operations. That was the first thing that they would try. So credential theft is really incredibly important and a massive potential vulnerability for organizations if they don't have some protections built up around being able to detect malicious behavior coming from an account where, you know, it shouldn't be coming from, even though the creds were legitimate. Thanks, Jen. Really interesting. Um, I know we're starting to run low on time here. So let me ask you one last question. Um, Do you have an example of Uh, phishing you've seen in the wild recently, or maybe the most nefarious or cleverest example of phishing you've ever seen executed in the wild? Sure. So one of my absolute favorite phishing examples, it was after we published a blog on a particular espionage motivated group. Um, And then a couple of weeks later, we were investigating some new samples that we saw, and they had actually taken um, a legitimate meeting for an event that Palo Alto Networks was holding at one of our, our offices. And they took the invite, turned it into a Word doc, and then they embedded their malware into it to weaponize it. And then they turned around and they sent that back out as though that were the legitimate email, which was fun. Like it was really obvious because we don't send invites like that as a Word doc attachments. But you know, it's nice sometimes to know that they're, they're paying attention to what you're doing. I imagine they're targeting a very specific audience. (laughs) All right, Jen. Well, thank you for uh, sharing all the information with us today. Uh, Folks, if you enjoy this show, please like, subscribe, comment, and visit paloaltonetworks.com. See you in the next episode.